This weekend, The Rise of Skywalker hits theaters, so today we're gonna stop and rank all six J.J. Abrams movies from the worst to the best. Hi, if you're new here, my name is Sean Chandler, and I started this channel because I was driving everyone around me crazy talking about movies way too much. If you can relate, you're probably in the right place. Consider clicking that subscribe button. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comment section. Share your ranking of all six J.J. Abrams films. My list isn't the right list. It's just my list, and I would love to see yours. As for me, I've been a really big J.J. Abrams fan ever since I first saw Alias over 15 years ago. Then in 2005, he started directing movies, and in his six films, he's tackled films in three Three different of my favorite franchises of all time. So what do I think about his take on these movies? Let's get started. Coming in in last place is Star Trek Into Darkness. With this movie, once again, he applied his usual bag of tricks to try and make a quick moving movie. He also tried to replicate the emotional resonance of the first Star Trek film that he made. And in doing so, he created a film that isn't short on entertainment value, but is really bad on a story level and pretty awful as a Star Trek movie. The big problem here is that he's making a Star Trek film, but he doesn't seem to have any love for what Star Trek is all about or any reverence for the rules that have been established in the past. And instead, he tries to use fan service to make up for it. And so the way the movie was marketed, they tried to hide who the villain was and then they tried to be this big surprise, like, hey, look, we are giving you this. And it tries to repeat scenes from classic Star Trek films in a way that's like, see fans, look what we're giving you. But at the core of the film, it misses the whole idea that Star Trek is about exploration. The Federation is about a peacekeeping mission. This movie is about a Federation that's out for war making weapons and we leave Earth Earth briefly and then go back to it. And so just at its core, it misses the entire point of Star Trek. There's a lot of conveniences and contrivances to set up and concoct the scenario that plays out inside of it. There's some very weird cyclical elements inside of it where, or not cyclical, but elements that are just immediately undone, like Captain Kirk loses being captain and five minutes later is made captain again. Just so many odd choices, all leading up to a finale where they try and do this big shocking thing in the climax of it. And then they immediately immediately undo it 10 minutes later with one of the worst plot devices ever to be introduced into Star Trek that literally cures death in a way that's like, wait, this is a problem if you're saying that this works. So in general, it's not a boring movie. I find it very watchable. I just don't find it to be a good movie. Number five is Super 8, J.J. Abrams' homage to 1980s Amblin films, and it is an Amblin film itself. If you're unfamiliar with this film, it's basically a prototype for what Stranger Things did. It also captures a lot of the tone of it. And if you enjoy those movies, you should definitely check this one out. On kind of an atmosphere level, J.J. does a great job of capturing the vibe of those films, kind of the coming of age aspect of them the dynamics between the kids and their banter. The performances are really good. Some of the heartfelt moments actually have a lot of punch and resonance to them. At the same time, the movie's not really as good as it probably should be, because at its core, there's kind of two stories that never fully go together. The actual origin of where this movie came from is that there were kind of two ideas being batted around about one about a train that crashes and something escaping from it, kind of Cloverfield-esque. And the other one was kind of this throwback to 1980s Amblin films about these kids making a Super 8 movie. J.J. pitches this to Steven Spielberg. Steven Spielberg says, yeah, do that as one. And so they just mushed these two ideas together and it's good, but it's not as good as it should be. There's structural problems. It leads to a finale that just doesn't feel like it matches the rest of the movie. It's not fully satisfying, comes off kind of corny. So while there's a lot of moments that are really great, the atmosphere is great, it functions a lot of ways really as that prototype I mentioned for movies that, or movies in a TV show that did a better job of capturing this type of story and 80s nostalgia, which came about five years later with Stranger Things in it. Coming in at number four is The Rise of Skywalker. Here, JJ was in a bit of a tough situation as he had to find a way to close out a trilogy, a trilogy of trilogies, and this whole Skywalker saga, and he had to do so with a fan base that was like distinctly split in half after The Last Jedi, and whether you loved or hated The Last Jedi, it didn't really set up an obvious finale. 
J.J. Abrams loves his mystery box. He actually gave a TED talk about this, where he loves creating intrigue. He did that in The Force Awakens with certain plot lines, and then Ryan Johnson just went, nope, those aren't going anywhere. And so then J.J. had to do a lot of, like, catching up and course correction to set up his finale, as well as deliver his finale all in one movie. For me, this movie, I enjoy the fun of it. I like going to this world of Star Wars and these characters. I didn't mind the actual answers that were delivered. Some people felt like it was too much fan service. They didn't like the return of Palpatine. All of that worked well enough for me. The big problem was that <laughs> This feels like they had to like microwave dinner for everybody. We got not enough time to get everything we want done, so we just gotta throw it in the microwave. And that's what kind of happened here where JJ needed to do two movies worth of story. He only had one movie, so he just had to rush through the whole thing. It wasn't a slow cooked story where it gets to play out and you get to properly set everything up and establish everything. It just has to kind of rush through it. Did I enjoy the ride? Sure. Do I enjoy microwave leftovers? Sure. But is the kind of properly cooked version better? Absolutely. That was kind of my take on this movie that uh, I did enjoy it. Still felt as, as the conclusion to a trilogy, trilogy, trilogies in the saga itself a little bit disappointing. Real quick, before I give you my top three, remember to share your ranking down below in the comment section. We're going to disagree, that's the fun part. Also, if you've enjoyed this video, I've done a bunch of other director rankings. I got Quentin Tarantino, Christopher Nolan, Paul Feig, John Favreau, Michael Bay of all people. You can check that out right up here, right after this video is done. In third place is Mission Impossible 3. With this film, J.J. kicked off the modern era of Mission Impossible films. If you look at Fallout, a bunch of plot lines and characters in that film go back to starting in this film, the kind of the tone, the vibe, the nature of them has kind of remained the same since this film. How J.J. got involved is that Tom Cruise binge watched the first two seasons of Alias and went, this is the guy right here to do the next Mission Impossible. Gave him a phone call, and then now we have the modern era of Mission Impossible films. If you watch the film after having seen Alias, you understand a lot better the storytelling tactics because he applies a bunch of the tricks that he honed in on and crafted together you doing several seasons of Alias and applied them to a Mission Impossible movie. There's showing scenes at the very beginning that happen much later inside of it, going into the personal life of the characters. All of this stuff, it comes from Alias, and it works really nicely in the Mission Impossible series to kind of give it a little bit of a kick in the pants after MI2 was Bit of a disappointment for most people. Inside of it, you've also got some just some fantastic action sequences, the bridge shootout, the Vatican kind of escape. You got one of the best villains in the whole franchise with Philip Seymour Hoffman. All of it leading to a fantastic final sequence where you get to see Tom Cruise run for like two miles straight. Put it all together and you just get a great addition to the Mission Impossible franchise and a great action movie and a great spy movie all in one. Our runner up is The Force Awakens. Back when Disney first acquired Lucasfilm and we learned they were going to do more Star Wars movies, a bunch of us speculated as to who they could get, and J.J. Abrams was one of those names that was way high on our list, but we thought, that's impossible. He's doing Star Trek. This Star Trek guy can't do Star Wars. But even what he did for Star Trek was he applied kind of the pacing and vibe of Star Wars to Star Trek, so he seemed like an obvious pick to do it. And then while he was doing the press tours for Star Trek Into Darkness and finishing up that movie, it's announced JJ is going to be the person to do the new Star Wars movie. And even to that, making that film was an incredible task in and of itself because the fan base didn't really respond all that well to the prequels over, overall. There's a generation of people that grew up with them that are rather fond of them, but people that grew up with the original trilogy for the most part rejected the prequels. So Disney's trying to do a lot of damage control with The Force Awakens, and I think J.J. Abrams did the best job that he could with the film, and the way that they tried to do damage control was basically just lean into nostalgia. Artistically speaking, could they have done more bold and brave choices? Sure, but did they deliver a Star Wars film that was reverent to the originals, that provided the sense of action that we enjoyed, the entertainment value? Absolutely, that's what he did with this, this movie. The new characters I thought were fun. The Return of the Legacy characters was quite enjoyable to see them. 
And all in all, it felt like a nice continuation. It was just like nice to go back to the world of Star Wars and feel like you're in the world of Star Wars. Now, certainly the movie sticks far too close to the template of A New Hope. I'm not a big fan of Starkiller Base. It feels kind of tacked on in the second half of the film. But overall, it was just so pleasant to get another Star Wars adventure. We just got swept away in this world and had a fun time. But coming in at first place is Star Trek 2009. J.J. Abrams takes Star Trek and gives it a 21st century overhaul in a way that I just thought worked really well. It digs deep into our characters, gives them an origin story, and finds a clever way to kind of tie it back into the actual existing continuity and give an explanation for how all these pieces fit together. Inside of it, you kind of get the perfect example of what J.J. Abrams does with his movies, which is kind of create these roller coaster rides where you have action sequences and then you kind of go down and you have big emotions and you go back up and there's a bunch of humor and then you go down another hill. Once this movie gets going, it does not let up from beginning to end. But I think the thing that makes this movie kind of click a little bit more for me is that it really touches on some kind of deep primal emotions. You're looking into kind of Kirk is this person who last lost his father when he was young and he's kind of wandering in adulthood because of that. Even though he has all this potential, that stuff just really resonates with me. The part where Pike calls out his potential and he chooses to kind of do something more with his life all of those things resonate really nicely with me. It's great to see Leonard Nimoy show up as classic Spock and kind of like filling in some gaps. And even though he's delivering exposition, he's doing it in a way that because it's him, it, it works really nicely. It's a very engaging sequence inside of it. But all in all, this of all of JJ's movies, this is the one that I think has the most emotions. It's the funniest of them. And then it has some fantastic action sprinkled all throughout it. As a lifelong Star Trek fan that loves more kind of classic cerebral Trek, this one, I thought, without doing anything to betray its past or feel like he just didn't understand it, he did something new with Star Trek and with these characters that I greatly appreciated. This was a movie that was huge for me when it first came out 10 years ago, and I love it every time I rewatch it. It's also fun, Chris Hemsworth's in the first 10 minutes and just like steals the scene for these small amount of screen time that he has. You absolutely remember him. It's one of those magic movies like that, where even these small parts have Chris Hemsworth in them before they were famous. So for me, this one comes in at number one. If you enjoyed this video and want more director rankings like this, check out that playlist right over there. I got a whole bunch of other directors in it. Thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies too much.